this mini lecture is about coordination of care and using care maps. This is Jane Turner speaking. I'm a pediatrician. I've worked with children with special health care needs and their families for many years and have found care maps to be a useful tool in coordinating care. So here are the learning objectives for this lecture. Um, well, at the end of the lecture, I hope you would be able to describe the characteristics of high quality co care coordination, would be able to utilize care mapping as a strategy to improve coordination of care, and we'll cover the what, how, who, when, and why of care maps. So let's start with uh, care coordination. This is a huge topic, and I have dedicated, I think, two slides to it. This is something, though, you will be experiencing many times and in many settings over the course of the MyLend uh, program. Care coordination is patient and family centered. That is key. It needs to be patient and family centered. It's proactive, planned, and comprehensive. So it's not just responding to problems when they come up, but thinking ahead and thinking of what are the goals for the child and the family and making a plan and a, and a plan that is comprehensive, not just medical or not just speech or not just hearing, but a comprehensive plan. Care coordination promotes self-care skills and independence, and it emphasizes cross-organizational relationships. This comes from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which has published many statements and policy statements and uh, helpful documents about care coordination. And successful care coordination takes into consideration a continuum of health, education, early child care, early intervention, nutrition, and the list goes on. Many, many domains representing many uh, disciplines. And the po point is to improve the quality of care for children and youth with special health care needs. Care coordination, now this is an important point. It is not the same as disease or disease management or case management. You will often hear about case management, which is very important and a very important function, but case management tends to fo focus on medical issues and tends to be within a specific agency. So for instance, Medicaid health plans frequently provide case management. Their focus is on the medical care and the medical issues of the client or beneficiary. Case managers in community mental health tend to focus on the mental health issues and may work with individuals in other agencies, but it's really much more focused on managing the care within that domain. Whereas care coordination, as we're talking about today, crosses domains, mental health, recreation, uh, physical health, medicine, um, and across um, many domains. But that's it. That's it on care coordination for now, on the big picture of care coordination, with the understanding that you're going to be learning much more about care coordination, and you're going to be implementing care coordination over the next uh, nine or ten months to get a much better idea of what it is. So now I'm going to talk about care maps, using care maps, care maps and care mapping. Uh, care mapping is a very useful strategy to assist families and professionals in care coordination. So a care map is patient-centered and family-driven, back to kind of that basic principle we were talking about with care coordination and really everything we talk about when we are working with uh, children with special needs. Patient-centered, family-driven. It identifies who is important to the patient, that being the child or youth. Identify who is involved in the care of the patient, and this may be family, lay people, extended family, other professionals. It also helps to identify community influences in the care of the patient or the child. And a care map helps us to remember to identify the various resources that a family and child may have available. So as we build a care map, some of the items we put on, some of the topics on the care map may not already be in uh, something the family is in touch with, but places they might, uh, resources they might use. So here's a care map. This is pretty complicated. You may have seen this before. This has been published um, in a number of places, at least in the child health literature. This was created by Kristen Lind, uh, a mother of, of a child who has very complex uh, medical, developmental, uh, and, health, and other health care needs. And Kristen's mom has been an advocate for children with special health care needs and shared this widely um, on the care map to show all the different 
uh, resources and people involved in her child's life. So the child is in the center. The child is G. And right around the child, the next is, of course, the family. Then if you look down to the southwest corner of the page, well, she's listed many, many of the uh, health care providers that are involved in G's life. So you can see that there's... Um, MGH is Mass General Hospital and the neurology and they go to the North Shore and the physiatry and then there's also medical equipment and going a little bit farther to the west there's the pediatrician who handles re referrals and triage and let's not forget the dentist and then over to the farther left farther to the west is Children's Hospital that would be Boston Children's and seeing many professionals there if you go to the uh, northwest corner in red, you can see many school and uh, educational resources, but then also includes occupational therapy and physical therapy and speech. Uh, but don't notice that she's also including the tr transportation. That's really important, including the bus driver is an important person in G's life. Then as you move more towards the northeast corner, you see information and advocacy, uh, family and professional partnerships and various organizations this family has been in touch with and uh, is working with. And then as we go in the clockwise direction, don't forget recreation and community. That's so important, and that's something we as professionals often neglect because we focus on solving the problems that are relevant to our particular disciplines, but recreation and community is clearly very important to children and family. And then there's the whole legal and financial. We'll talk about this later, especially as uh, children or youth are getting ready for um, transition into um, adulthood, but it doesn't start then. It starts uh, much earlier in, in terms of legal and financial. And then there's support. Here she has support with all the different family and extended family and neighbors, etc. So this is a pretty big team, and it helps you see, as you put it on a page like this, you can see not only how complex it is and what a rich map this is, there are so many individuals and so many agencies, but you can start to see the relationships between them and maybe draw some lines and see where communication would be helpful. So that's a care map created by Kristen Lynn about her, her, um, her daughter. We're going to now create a care map about a, a patient. This is built on a patient that I saw a few years ago. With some of the facts have been changed so that you can't identify um, this little boy. But Miles is a child with um, a two-year-old with spina bifida and a hydrocephalus. He also has a club foot, has hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis is a kidney problem where the kidney doesn't drain well and water accumulates on the kidney. Hypospadias. Hypospadias is a problem with the um, where the urethra is on the end of the penis. He also has atrial septal defect. That's a, a heart disease, a, a, a birth defect of the heart, and developmental delay. And he's gaining weight slowly. So let's start and put together a bit of a care map for Miles. So we start with Miles in the begin in the middle. So there he is, right in the middle of that target. The two-year-old boy Miles with his family around him. One thing you might notice about this particular care map template, besides having the circle in the middle, it has a list of potential services and agencies on the, along the bottom. That's just to give you kind of a reminder, just to tweak your, um, your memory of things to think about. So let's start with Miles when this, and in, in here you can see the medical has been added. He has a primary care pediatrician. He goes to a multidisciplinary team for children with myelodysplasia. He also has, because of his club foot, he goes to an orthopedic doctor, he sees a cardiologist for the problem with his heart, and he has medical supplies and he needs medicine, so he has a pharmacy and he has physical therapy. So this is, this is a pretty good picture of the medical, uh, the people involved in his medicine. It's quite a few people, actually, uh, as you uh, take a look at that. A lot for a family to interact with. But then we have to build out, remember Miles has uh, some developmental delay and he's involved in um, early on, or at least he should be involved in early on, that's early intervention for his education and his development. And even if he didn't have developmental delay, given all of his medical issues, he's at risk for having some uh, developmental issues and should be uh, referred to early on. 
But if you look at early on, early on is not just one thing. There's an early on coordinator, and then there's a teacher that comes to the home, and he also is getting speech therapy and physical therapy. So again, um, there's a lot. There are a lot of individuals here for this family to interact with, and also there may be a number of appointments to coordinate. But that's not all about Miles. There's more going on with Miles. We need to know a little bit about his home situation and his family because the family is so critical, is so, is so much um, the center. He is the center of their life and they are the center of his life. So Miles lives with his mother. His mother, mother, mother's mother is very involved in his care. Miles has a young sibling. Now remember, Miles is only two, so this is a family with two little ones at home and with Miles with his many medical appointments and his early on appointments. Miles' sibling is a half-sibling. Miles' mother and father have separated, and Miles' father and her, his mother's new partner are in considerable conflict. So much that there was physical altercation, and Miles' father has been incarcerated because of the conflict between um, the two men. To complicate matters for Miles, the maternal grandmother, who is so important in his life, she moves often to different counties across the state, and mother follows. There's been domestic violence in the home, as we noted above, and some previous domestic violence, not just that between father and mother's new partner, but there was some, some violence in the home uh, between father and, uh, and, and mother previously. And there's substance abuse in the home and extended family can be difficult to know whether the substance abuse is merely historical or whether it's ongoing as one works with the family. So this is a pretty complicated family. Lots going on. Miles' life is pretty complicated. So let's see what this looks like on a care plan, a care map, and see if that can help us. So here's filling out the care map a little bit more. So now you'll notice in the northeast corner, there's community health and community mental health for mental health services. And here, this could be expanded out. How much of this is community mental health specifically directed at Miles, and then how much for his for support for his mother? So this might be you might have several different uh, branches off of that uh, uh, that line of community mental health. And then down in the uh, southeast corner, you've got many of the social factors, and this is just the thumbnail sketch of what's going on. Miles has been involved in the foster care system. Children's Protective Services has been involved. He was removed from the home, from the home for a while because of concern about substance abuse in the home and because of the domestic violence in the past or when it was when there was um, the altercation in the past. So the criminal justice system is involved in Miles' life indirectly with his father being incarcerated. And in the home, there's the mother. The grandmother is in and out. Father is as distance involvement, stepfather is definitely involved, and then there's the extended family. So, okay, so here we've got it all here, and I think it's more helpful to have it spread across the page and written out like this than just as a list, because now we can start to look to see where can we draw some lines, some communication, and what is what's missing, and is there any duplication? So one of the things that crosses my mind is, hmm, is the early on coordinator or the teacher who's going into the home often is that individual communicating with community mental health? Are they able to work together so that they're not stepping on each other or tripping over each other, but uh, work together to maximize, to optimize the services for Miles and his family? How about Children's Protective Services? Are the individuals there communicating with community mental health? And as we look at the medical, how about who on the medical team should be in touch with community mental health, CPS, or early on? What's the optimal relationship? How can people keep track of what's going on? What happens if Miles misses an appointment? Is there anyone who's going to look into it? So you can start to draw some lines here by having this on a page where you can visualize who's involved in Miles' life. So here's the care map template. It's pretty simple. You don't really need to print it off. You could just take a piece of paper and draw a circle in the middle. And hopefully you'll do that occasionally as you're working with families. And we'll have an opportunity to do that on some of our Zoom sessions. So we've, I said we would talk about the what and the who. So who does the care map? 
Well, the patient and the family should be in the driver's seat. Any member of the team can participate, and really anyone aspiring to support families coordinate care in any domain of life can take the lead, take out a piece of paper, and start the care map, and work with the family to put it together. When would you do a care map? Well, when we're working with a family one-on-one. -on -one. In a clinical setting, one can sit down and say, let's talk about who's involved in your child's life. Let's put it together. And if it's an older child, ask the child, ask the youth. Who's involved? Who should be involved? Who do you see? Where are you going? And don't forget the recreation and the community and the neighborhood life. This is something that you might want to do at a home visit. A nice way to sit down and really talk about all the things going on and all the people, all the services, and where, are the, where the gaps are. A care map can be created and can be useful in a multidisciplinary team discussion. And, and it's really helpful if there's family participation. I know logistically that doesn't always happen, but if a family can, can participate. But imagine having the team sit down together and say, okay, let's create a care map. And um, we can often learn from each other about resources, about agencies, about people involved in the child's care, as well as I then identify where are some of the, the, the gaps. And a care map can be a first document that can help you design a treatment plan. So why would you do a care map? Well, the care map, I think this is after this conversation, this discussion, you can you could fill in the gaps here. It shows the resources and needs of the child. It helps to identify gaps as well as duplications. It can show the relationships between the various components of a child's team. And then another that I think is helpful for us as professionals, care maps, help us to visualize the systems of services for children and families. So besides identifying the systems and the resources for an individual child, it can be a nice visual to help us recognize the many services, the different systems, and how they overlap. So for instance, the educational system early on, early childhood special ed, special ed is that goes on, and then there's the after school program, and then how does that interact with the community mental health or other behavioral health resources? And what about the legal system? And it helps us to, it's a nice, nice to have a visual where you see the various systems and can see where they can overlap. So let's just take this to wrap it up and bring it back to what we're doing in MyLen. So in terms of our role of, in, in leadership, in learning leadership, Care mapping can help us understand the systems that are important to children with autism spectrum disorder or other neurodevelopmental disabilities. Care maps are inherently interdisciplinary and help us learn to think across disciplines and across domains. Care maps are family-centered. They really do promote family-centered care. The child and family are at the center of the map, and care maps should, the family should drive the process and the family owns the map. So we will, in terms of equity, it's a little harder to see exactly where does equity fit in because care maps are not specifically a strategy to promote equity. However, promoting good care and good health is good for health equity for all. So hopefully, as we're working, we'll be able to use care maps for all of our clients uh, and uh, improve the care coordination. And again, we will use care maps during our Zoom sessions when we talk about cases. There's not a lot of homework regarding the care map itself, other than to be thinking about what are all the services, what are the resources, and how can we promote family-centered care and really high-quality coordination of care. So that's, that's my wrap-up for now, and we will talk more during the Zoom sessions.